Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and welcome back to my own little media blitz of Final Fantasy VI stuff. A, a bunch of videos and interviews and, and gameplay demos. So many things have just released out of nowhere for Final Fantasy XVI as part of their media tour. And I'm just going over it all, little by little, piece by piece, and posting what I go through on the channel. Twitch chat is here as well. They're busy saying hi to you. And uh, just before this, I watched Gematsu's kind of like B-roll videos that they posted of pretty much all the contents from the uh, demo preview that they got to participate in. And now I'm going to take a look at an interview that Gamatsu actually did as well. I looked through a few of the questions without reading the answers and decided that it was probably going to be an interesting read. But I also know it's a very long interview. So, I mean, pr practically every interview is going <laughs> to, I got to decide like case by case if I'm even going to post it to YouTube. But for this one, we're looking at the Gamatsu one. And on YouTube, if you want to support the original interview, please, uh, Use the description of the video to click on the original link so you can give them hits and, and stuff and all that. I'm looking at the read-only version so I can avoid all the ads, but I've already I've already clicked on their sites. I've already gotten the ads once, so I don't feel too bad about that. But this is an interview with Yoshi P, the director, Hiroshi Takai, and Ryota Suzuki. Every time I see Hiroshi Takai, for, for those who weren't around in the earlier days of 14, most people first got to know about him because they sat him down in front of uh, a computer and made him like do Atma farming for like 12 hours straight or something like that as part of one of our anniversary streams for Final Fantasy 14. So he's referenced in a few things. He was referenced in one of the, uh, the anniversary events and he's, he was a fixture for a lot of the year to year streams for quite some time until eventually, of course, moving on to being the director of Final Fantasy 16. And Ryota Suzuki, the combat lead, Devil May Cry 5 and Marvel vs. Capcom 2. I mean, that's, it's never gonna be enough. This interview almost made me click away from it with this though. Gamatsu, why do you gotta do it? There you go. Uh, full interview below. So it looks like they shared a slot with uh, RPG fan and Den of Geek. So this is actually kind of taking care of three different interviews all at once. So I guess that's uh, I guess that that covers. That's why this interview is so long on this page. It's like a massive, massive interview. So the first question, the choice for Ifrit for Clive, was that chosen from the start? Did you, oops, sorry, did you build the game around that or was it a story and world building that led you to choose Ifrit as Clive or Clive as Ifrit? I'm not gonna say that Clive equals Ifrit. We're gonna keep that little bit in a gray area, but when designing the game, the idea that Ifrit was going to be a main core component was something we decided very early on. I mean, you kind of had to. It's, it's from the very beginning felt like Ifrit is literally the core of the game, not Bahamut, not like not some other being like an Ultima weapon or like even an individual yet. It feels like at its core, Ifrit is everyone. He is the antagonist. He is the protagonist. He's he's everything. So I feel like knowing that very early on has kind of translated really well with all their marketing and all of the materials that we've seen so far. Uh, the reason we decided to go with Ifrit uh, is because Ifrit is usually one of the first summons you encounter. Really good decision. He appears first, you defeat him first, you get him first, and then he's the first summon you stop using. <laughs> Listen, I mean, I wasn't gonna say it, but like, yeah, you know, it's, it's, he, they right. <laughs> I like the reasoning. It's like, let's make Ifrit cool again, because normally everyone's just like, wow, Ifrit. And then we, never mind, I don't want to use him. So at least they know. From a design perspective, the design for Ifrit is really, really cool. The element of fire is really easy to understand. And if you've played Final Fantasy, even if you didn't make it to the end, most players are all going to know Ifrit. And so it's one of the most recognizable summons. Yeah, it's another good point. Even people who don't know much about Final Fantasy probably know Ifrit. Because if you've even played for like an hour, you've probably encountered him in any game that you may have touched. So, I mean, in Final Fantasy XIV, by level 20, which, you know, even people who quit before finishing A Realm Reborn would see free. So, uh, pretty sound logic. Probably another reason why, well, Garuda is, and Titan are actually probably because they're the other two you see in Final Fantasy XIV really early. So that's probably why the marketing also went with Titan and Garuda as some of the other ones. Shiva as well, but Shiva's kind of there with Ifrit. It's one you see super early. And they just picked a lot of the easily recognizable summons, which is why even though we know Leviathan is in that world somewhere, Leviathan's in a mural somewhere. We haven't seen them because Leviathan's, while maybe recognizable to hardcore fans, is definitely a less recognizable summon than things like Ifrit, Garuda, Titan and Shiva. So, curiously, and Ramu, as a matter of fact. Final Fantasy 16 is obviously very different in a lot of ways. This is from Den of Geek, from other recent Final Fantasy titles, but when you were talking about Sid, you used the word constants. Were there a series of constants at the start of development that the team said, no matter what we do, we have to have this in the game? 
Chocobos, Moogles, some of the ships like the Enterprise. We haven't said anything about the Enterprise, but you know, you can assume that maybe we'll have an Enterprise. Yeah, I mean, an airship at some point is kind of expected. And then, of course, the magic names, weapon names, monsters like Marlboro, not Marlboros, that's a, that's a cigarette. <laughs> Marlboros, Corals, and Behemoth. We've seen that Final Fantasy over the past 10 or 15 years has shifted from older fa fantasy into more science fiction type game. A lot of recent games have been playing with that. But for us here that all grew up with Final Fantasy from one up to up until about six, we play those in real time and they left a lasting impression. They were more of a classic fantasy, that type of gothic fantasy. Think about what type of fantasy we wanted to create. We wanted to go back to the roots to bring in some of that gothic fantasy. Yeah, and that's been a big, big point since we first started seeing. Like, it's it's far more fantasy than than science fantasy. Because, I mean, Seven has, you know, Midgar, and Eight has, you know, the the the, the gardens, and not, even Nine has some pretty, uh, some pretty high technological stuff, not just including towards the end of the game, but even early on with, like, some of the cities and whatnot. Everything has been about technology since seven, kind of, except 11, I guess. But even 11 has some of that stuff. But yeah, 11 is kind of like the closest thing you get to like not having this like high tech stuff around, or at least it being far less prevalent. So um, even six, I mean, six they're talking about has Magitech, which is like a huge, huge aspect of the game. So uh, yeah, no, I get, what he, I get what he's saying. He says about six. So I kind of understand why he says about six, because... You know, it still has some gothic elements, but a lot, a lot of science and stuff like that. Uh, one thing is bringing back the focus on the crystals, something you saw earlier in the series. We focused a lot on putting the main influence on the mother crystals here in 16. Uh, for the director, another thing you see a lot of in Final Fantasy games is that there's always some kind of civilization that existed in the past. We've already seen previews of this in 16 as well. And he even says it right here. We have that. They're called the Fallen. And you see remnants of the Fallen civilization all throughout the land. We've already been seeing that, like I said. And you learn a little bit more as you explore in the game. Okay. Fully expected and, you know, perfectly respectable. For Final Fantasy 16, this question actually from Gamatsu, you were given a major challenge of leading the creation of an all-new battle system. And coming from a background of Devil May Cry, there will obviously be a lot of comparisons. Fair. How, when taking on this challenge, did you figure out what to bring over from past works, what to innovate on, and how to bring it all together to make it feel like a Final Fantasy combat system while being brand new? And of course, this question really matters the most for Ryota Suzuki, who again, Devil May Cry 5 and Marvel vs. Capcom 2, you need say nothing else. Because one of the main themes of the game is the icons, we wanted not only the story to focus on icons, but for the battle to have that flavor as well. So while Clive is a master of the sword, he also learns these new iconic abilities as he goes through his journey, and those become his own actions. But making those actions feel like they both tie into the story as well as into battles, such as how they feel, how they look, how they play, how they pertain to where he is in the story was the main challenge. The other thing is that this is the first full action game in the Final Fantasy series. I mean, I guess technically there's wait mode in 15, but like, I, interesting, <laughs> an interesting way to say it's the first full action game. I don't know. I think most people would still say 15 and, you know, it's seven remake right beforehand, but I, I get it because those are still kind of menu based a little bit. Like 15 still has some menu related systems and this seems to be completely menu -less. So I think that's why he's saying it's the first full action game is that there's absolutely no menuing. It's all, you know, one, a, you press a button, it activates something. So that actually makes, uh, I, I, think, I think that's more along the lines of what they're going for here. First action game that they ever play. So we wanted to make sure that it's accessible to those users. At the same time, we want it to be something that's gonna excite heavy action users. Those people who play Devil May Cry in those types of games, hell yeah. Something that is a very low floor, but a very high ceiling and covers all the bases while still feeling really, really good. What I learned at Capcom, spending all my time there working on action games, the 2D fighting games, like uh, games like Monster Hunter and Devil May Cry, taking all those things that I learned from creating those types of action games, I was able to take the best parts of those and use them to create the battle system of Final Fantasy 16. And for those players that aren't familiar with action games, we wanted to create something that had the feel of an action game, but also have this ease of use and accessibility, without there being too high of a hurdle for these players to jump. To sum it up, we didn't want it to be difficult to understand, but we want it to appeal to heavy. Yeah, I mean, I, I listen, I'm the master of saying the same thing 15 different times. He said it 16 different times. And yes, that's a pun. It, it's, it's as we expected. I mean, that's, that's kind of like the go-to default answer for a question like this, especially for Final Fantasy 16 in particular. But it's also what they simply have to achieve. A lot of people 
are still apprehensive about jumping into action-based Final Fantasy games. And it's not just because they're like, haha, turn base is the greatest thing ever made. It's also because they're genuinely intimidated by it. So marketing around the accessibility is one of the most important things you could do. And Square's accessibility in some regards has gotten a lot better with their side franchises. Theater Rhythm, which just came out not too long ago, I just put out a review for that if you haven't watched it, has a huge accessibility, a huge amount of accessibility with the party customization, the summons, the items to make sure that even if you aren't necessarily great at all the songs, you can start, you can play and learn and get better with um, with the systems they've built in the game. And that seems to be very much what they're going for here as well. But I do want to see how it ends up playing at that high action level because I'm someone who plays the Devil May Cry games. I've beaten every Devil May Cry game on every difficulty. Rec most recently, Devil May Cry 5, you know, as well as, you know, once they gave us the uh, special edition with Virgil. Like, I've, I've, I've gone through it. So I am going to be, you know, going ham on on this so i'm a very very big on the anticipation for the action aspects of the game the summons in final fantasy are super iconic uh because they're called i uh, i uh, no okay but sometimes you guys like to throw curveballs when you replace them for example quetzalcoatl replaced ramu in final fantasy 8 and final fantasy 12's espers are totally different well they're different from not tactics but they belong to tactics, so sort of. Were there any espers or icons you guys wanted to put into 16 that they may have, that may have gotten cut or you really loved, but said we can't make that work? I don't know that they'll answer this. Uh, you guys want super safe with the iconic summons. I'm curious if there are new ones you may have put in too. This came from RPG fan, by the way. Yeah, even Yoshi P is like, I don't know that I want to answer this because if I say the wrong, if I say the wrong answer, then it's going to be taken the wrong way. Original concept, we wanted to make something that's accessible to a lot of people. When looking back on all the games in the series, we wanted to choose summons that people had played, maybe from this game or that game or whatever, ones that they all know. And then taking those, like you said, iconic summons and recreating them from the pixel art into something that is made with the cutting edge technology that looks very real, whether it be design or size. That being said, it's really hard to say, but there are some battles with some enemies that are very large and maybe things that players will not have seen before and may not have seen before in the series. It's really hard to say without spoiling. Yeah, I mean, because if he just says, like, what if it's not a summon? Like, what if Diablos is in the game, but he's not a summon? Like, he can't say that, Di or Alexander. Like, what if Alexander's a boss, but not a summon or something like that? Like, it's, it's really hard to go out of their way and say they did or didn't do something without spoiling that the thing is or isn't in there, like, completely. So it's 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 really really tough to navigate. Like I wouldn't be surprised to see like Siren, or uh, or like Pandemonium or or, or Cerberus or like they, they're monsters that have been some. It's Doom Train, like it's or Phantom Train, however you want to go. Like all of those things could be there. But they may not be summoned. So like these large enemies, like I hope Diablos is in the game, but I don't need him to be an icon. I just want to fight him in this game with this game's gameplay. So I'm hoping for a lot of those summons, but not necessarily as summons. And Torgol is kind of like Fenrir. So I count him as like Fenrir kind of for the game. Just tiny and adorable Fenrir, but also vicious, you know. Uh, in that sense, we wanted to bring out these icons that players already knew. And not really create new ones specifically for Final Fantasy 16. That being said, you mentioned before, were there any we had an idea of that we were going to put in, but maybe cut? Turns out there was one from a past Final Fantasy that we were thinking of using, but ended up not using it. Do you want to say the name? Takai. I don't want to say it. <laughs> so one day I hope they answer this question. Who was, and swear if it's Diablos, because I, I wanted you to include Diablos in some way. Even if it's just like a regular boss, I don't care. Spent so much time and effort and cost creating all this stuff. There was a point in time where we thought we had too much. It was getting to the point where it's like, okay, we have this many icons. Maybe we should actually cut one because it's getting a little bit too costly. But then when we ran the numbers, it turned out it would cost more to remove it from the game than leave it in. So we ended up leaving it in. That's pretty funny. So there's something So there's something in here that doesn't belong in here. How much do you want to bet that's Leviathan that they're talking about right here? I think they might be talking about, because we haven't seen anything on Leviathan. So it makes sense that in their uh, promotion materials, they maybe thought Leviathan was one too many and thought about cutting it, but that it was, again, more costly to cut. I think I, I'm speculating they're talking about Leviathan here, and that's why we've barely seen, we've seen one mural with Leviathan in it, and that's it. Um, Alexander would be another guess of one they, that they would use for that, yeah. But I'm guessing that they're talking about Leviathan. 
Uh, Den of Geek, I can only imagine how difficult it was to work on two Final Fantasy titles at the same time, 14 and 16. Were there any benefits to that process? Were there ways that w work on one game that improved the work of the other or opened up new ideas? I think we've lost so much more than we've gained, like time to sleep, my youth. <laughs> You know what, Yoshi P? Yeah, no, we know, we know, we know. Yeah, no, that's um, you definitely don't have time to sleep. That's that's definitely something that we've observed as well. The pressure has also been heavy. This is just one of those situations where there's a lot of things we learn because we're on both. But one thing that we really have learned due to our time on 14 is about our communication with the community and being honest with them. That's something I wanted to maintain while on 16 as well. For example, when promoting the game, a lot of recent AAA games have been going the open world route. And you see a lot of games like Hogwarts doing that. And when promoting it, it would have been very easy for us to scurry around that and promote our game as the same type of thing rather than telling the truth. So we thought, let's just get out ahead of it. Let's tell them we're not open world but then again, let be truthful and tell them why we didn't go with the open world. We didn't go that route because we wanted this game to, that spanned many different nations and wanted to tell a detailed story that would not have been possible if we had an open world situation. So basically, we took this thing that currently can appear to be a negative in a sense, got out in front of it and talked about it, which they've talked about it a while now, and let the fans know exactly what we're doing instead of trying to cover it up. It would have been easy to just not mention it at all and get people thinking it's open world, but that would end up disappointing them at the end. So instead, we were truthful and let people understand that we were thinking of why we did this. Yeah, after Final Fantasy 15 and after 7 Remake both before this, I think a lot more people see the benefits of one versus the other. 15 struggled a lot with um, losing track of the story and not necess and then just needing to feel like even Elden Ring, I love Elden Ring. It's my favorite Souls game. But the open world is absolutely at times a negative, even for such a monstrous game as that, because it leads to a lot of reused assets, reused bosses. You kind of lose that excitement when you're exploring a little bit. It becomes more about the item you found and less about any of the environments or the risks or the exploration. Like it just it loses something in the process. There's always something lost with open world. And I also think there's a common misconception that most Final Fantasy games are open world. They're not. Most Final Fantasy games have a world map, but the number of places you can go at any given time is largely restricted. At the end of the game, when you get the airship, then you can revisit everything, do the things you missed, whatever. And at that point, it becomes full open world. So like having open areas or open linear, as, as chat has put it right here, I think is the healthier way to do it. It's like the in-between. And they've kind of implied that some of the areas here work that way. But they've also said that there are lots of set pieces that are on the narrow path. You know, like there might be like a side room or something in order to explore and find something extra. But there's it's not like a, oh, you know, you're going to walk up to this castle and, you know, you'll just find castles that you'll just randomly explore out in the world and stuff like that. Like that's that's doesn't that's not the route that they're going with it. Um, so you'll basically be going from area to area and exploring within those areas as you progress through the story. But you're not just like able to go everywhere, anywhere, anytime, everything. So um, and I think that's honestly better given some of the games I've played in recent years, even the ones I've liked. I'd prefer something more narratively driven and focused. Uh, anyway, on to the next question. So much of what we've seen so far of 16 has been very dark in tone. Will there be any lighter elements, either story-wise or gameplay-wise? Gameplay-wise, can we expect things like mini-games, fishing, Blitzball? Okay, obviously not Blitzball. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, the 16 equivalent of Blitzball, Clive Ball. I want to fire Gamatsu. Gamatsu, can I just get the other two people who are in this interview right now? Can I just, can you, can we, can you exit stage left? What is this? Clive Ball. We have some very dark themes the story revolves around. We have countries at war, so we can't really have Blitzball matches going on when people are killing each other. Why not? <laughs> Final Fantasy X does it just fine, it seems. Uh, and then you've got this hero who's talking about and driven by revenge, like, I'm going to go out and fish. In that sense, there aren't those types of light things that are going to detract from the story. Okay. However, if you remember from the presentation, we talked about Sid, and Sid has this organization. Their headquarters is this place called The Hideaway. And once Clive meets up with Sid and is able to join the organization, then you have this kind of hub where all these side contents that are separate from the main story start. So you have things like quests where you can learn about the people in The Hideaway, or quests where you can learn about the people in the world. You can upgrade Clive, earn more inventory slots and things like that. There are other types of activities as well, such as the hunt board, which they've mentioned before. It'll talk about a notorious monster roaming the land, and your task is to try and find and defeat this monster for fame. So in other words, cutting back on the little fun mini games for what is more practical side content, 
And given it's an action game, I'm not too surprised. Like it's a full action game from start to finish. Like I guess I, I, I'm trying to relate it to other titles that they've worked on before. And specifically with Ryota, um, he's used like Devil May Cry doesn't have things like that, like fishing and whatnot. So I guess I'm not too surprised to see them go the wayside with things like that when it's the tone is so serious. Because how many times have we had a meme? I'm going to go save the world, but first fishing. Yeah, or I'm going to go save the... Like, literally it being in the middle of Final Fantasy VIII and uh, being in space, the spaceship is, like, about to... It's going into emergency mode. It's about to be completely destroyed. And you're like, well, I better challenge her to a card game before she's not available anymore. <laughs> You know, like those those take us, yeah, those take us out of the moment kind of things, yeah. So, I listen, I actually appreciate those things. I think it's honestly an ironic bit of fun to have something so dark happening and to be able to do things like that. I actually do find there to be entertainment value. There's, there's lasting meme value, it's content, and... You know, it's it's just it's a fun little thing just to have involved. That being said, I can understand when trying to approach the game like the way they're approaching it, why you wouldn't do that. I am going to miss those things, however, because when those systems are done well, they are very good. 15's fishing is fantastic, for example. Triple Triad is great in 8. And there's a ton of mini games throughout the franchise that are good distractions. There's also Blitzball. So, you know, you got to take the good with the bad, I suppose. Uh, then moving on, I'm going to have Takai talk a little bit more about it. There's even more types of side content as well. Things that are not... Oh, an arcade? Oh, wait, they, so they do have this stuff. There's an arcade mode which you can earn high scores. Well, arcade mode sounds like you're still fighting, but it's for leaderboards instead of for the story. So it's it's probably not like an arcade arcade. It's probably like, you know, like a, like a Bloody Palace, maybe, style thing. Uh, leaderboards, we'll have him talk about that more later, but one thing we want you to understand is that the media tour in this demo we gave you takes out parts of the game focused on combat. Uh, and so because of that, it's going to be very violent, it's going to be very dark, it's going to be very action-oriented, and not really touch upon the more lighter aspects. There are lighter aspects, there are more emotional aspects. You have themes such as brotherly love, the love of a nation, love of others, friendships, bonds, and things you come to expect from the Final Fantasy series. Those types of themes will be covered in 16, and there are portions that are going to go get deeply emotional. There are also lighter parts because when you talk about a story that's dark, it's always about finding hope, and there's a lot of hope in this game as well. Takai... Uh, and like we mentioned before, while we don't have many games like Fishing or Blitzball, we do have a lot of content that focuses on our action and battle system. So that's what I was just talking about before. Lots of different types of challenging content. There's a special mode, a battle mode, in which you are locked to a certain ability of a single icon, and you must clear a bunch of different content in order to earn special items. There's also New Game Plus, which carries over your play data, and you're able to play again. Now, you can do that in the story focus mode or action focus mode, but for New Game Plus, we also have a third mode called Final Fantasy mode, which is not only more difficult, but changes enemy placement and the enemies that you fight. It's, 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 um, what's it called? It's not, it's not Dante Must Die. It's, uh, it's what's it called? Son of Sparta, essentially. Son of Sparta difficulty is what I would probably guess that that's placed at. It isn't just a harder version. It's also a different type of experience. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be New Game Plusing and doing that. I can guarantee you that we're doing a Final Fantasy mode. Another thing that's available is the hide in the hideaway, which is mentioned, is you unlock a side game where you can replay stages to earn score. He mentioned that earlier. We call that our arcade mode. And if you play the arcade mode in New Game Plus, you have the ability to upload your scores to the global leaderboard and see how they stack up against other players around the world. So all that combined outside the main story, there's a lot of different content to keep the player engaged uh, beyond just the main story. Yeah, and I'm sure there's going to be like secret bosses and stuff like that as well. Um, I, that's that's such a staple to Final Fantasy that I would be surprised if they didn't have something like that. But they're not going to say, oh, we've got secret boss fights because then they're not a secret. you got to find them. Uh, were there any characters you and the staff are largely fond of? They've answered this before. I remember them answering this. Um, doesn't want to give too many spoilers. Yeah, Yoshida said this last time too. There's a character we haven't met yet that he loves. Yeah, we've gotten this answer answer before. He says he's a little, yeah, he's very lovable, kind of comedic, and he loves him because he's a little bit of that light and the darkness. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's an answer we've gotten before. Suzuki, I, yeah, I think Ryota Suzuki's answered this before and said Clive as well. He's been he's been polishing Clive for the last three years. That's all I've done. I love that man. <laughs> and Takai, uh, I would if. 
What's it called? Uh, if you made me choose right now, I'd probably choose Sid. Mention that Sid turns into sort of a father figure. You have Clive, who's basically focused on revenge and revenge only. And then Sid comes in and not being condescending or anything, just kind of opens up Clive's eyes to the fact there's another world out there. It's not all about what you see. What you see is important, but take a look at what else is going on around you. I have a feeling Sid's going to be a lot of people's favorite characters. So he's, I mean, we have a Sidolphus who's a thunder god. So like some people have already decided he's their favorite before even experiencing him at all. So I'm very much expecting him to be a, a community favorite across different. I love, I just love that we have a, a Sid that's a thunder god. It's just, it's so good. You mentioned different eras of Final Fantasy, fantasy, sci-fi, things like that. Is it your hope that 16 can be a new path forward for the franchise? Or do you hope that every Final Fantasy game can always be different? They've also kind of answered this before where they said they believe every Final Fantasy game should try to be its own thing. We don't want to push Final Fantasy series in one direction. Yeah, it's one thing I remember when I first joined 14. The director, Katase-san, told me that Final Fantasy is what the creators at that time think Final Fantasy should be. And that's what you should do in creating this game. And I really took that to heart. And so I want that to want to do the same thing that creators moving forward can do. What they think is the best is what they can make. Because that's what we're doing. What we thought would be the best Final Fantasy is what we're creating. One thing I've noticed working with the series for so long and speaking to fans from around the world is a lot of people started that Final Fantasy is this type of series. I'm looking at it as a series, for example, has become very niche in the sense that Final Fantasy series is about JRPGs or anime characters or teens running off saving the world. I mean, they're not wrong, Yoshi P. And that's what all the games are going to be like. And then people are kind of getting locked into this image of what they believed Final Fantasy was. But for me, as someone who's going to be 50 years old this year, listen, you don't look an age, you don't look a day over 49, Yoshi P. I know that the world isn't all sunshine and rainbows and stuff, and I know it can be tough as well as have hope in it sometimes. So I wanted to create something that, again, felt real, but not just for my generation, but for the younger generation as well, and show that the potential of the Final Fantasy series. As for why we went Dark Fantasy, well, just because we love Dark Fantasy. Yeah, we've gotten all this answered before. Talked about the player base gets locked in a vision of what Final Fantasy is, but it's the same on the development side. People in Square Enix think that when making Final Fantasy, we have to do it this way because this is the way they did it in the past. What we wanted to do and what we wanted to show the next generation with the younger developers is that 16 is that you don't have to be locked into that. You can do whatever you want and anything is possible. Yep. And uh, you know what? I'd say you're off to a very good start with that one. Uh, one of the things you guys stressed with the icon battles, that each is unique. We got a small taste of that in the demo, which played pretty similarly to how Clive normally plays. I'm curious, by every battle is unique, what do you mean in that sense? Is each battle going to play as different as a different genre? I noticed in the footage you guys showed there was something that looked sort of like a shoot 'em up. What are you guys doing to make each battle unique, and how are you doing it without making everything feel too gimmicky? Not to say the battle we played was gimmicky, but for other battles. Basically, when deciding on what to do with each of these battles, we kind of knew where the beats were going to be and when Clive would encounter each of these icons. So each battle was given a theme. For example, Ifrit versus Garuda, something like a pro wrestling match, something that was like uh, tokusatsu, like Evangelion or Ultraman type of battles. And that was the main theme, something that had a really weighty feel to it when you're like you're controlling these giant kaijus or mechs. But when uh, but the others also got their own unique theme. For example, you saw a battle that looked like a shoot 'em up. So we have one battle that we wanted to focus on making kind of like a shoot 'em up. And this is completely different from the Clive type of actions that we have now for the shoot 'em up battle. We also have another one that's very dynamic, speedy type of battle where you have the icon fighting something much larger than itself, and you're running around and using that character as the entire stage. When the player is controlling Clive, you have this sense of having full control over him. But when creating these dynamic battles, we wanted to move the focus from Clive and focus it on the icons because that was more important in those scenes. And so creating these battles that felt separate from the actual Clive battles, fresh from those Clive battles, and focusing on how each icon interacts with the icons and the special type of moves they're going to do only in that type of situation. Yeah, so in other words, the way Garuda wants to attack Clive is not the same way Garuda is going to want to attack Ifrit. Because one, they're they're functionally different targets, so that she shouldn't be trying to fight them in the exact same way. So that's just kind of how it's going to be for the rest of them as well. And again, with these icon versus icon, I, <laughs> icons just misspelled battles, unlike a lot of the fights in the field, which could be random or just there, these are all tied in directly with the storyline. So there has to be a reason why these two are fighting and what the two icons are feeling. What is their story? Why are they fighting? Why are they at that location? What are the reasons? All these kind of tie into the fight and how we're going to design the battle. So it all comes down to the situation. What fits the story? 
For example, so when we say we have a shoot 'em up battle, it's not just throwing you into a random shoot 'em up because we wanted to make it a gimmick. It's because it fits that situation. For Garuda and Ifrit, the players that they played the way the feel that we gave it, the kind of weighty feel, kind of all out brawls because story wise, the two have kind of lost themselves. So neither of them have control. They just get this battle that feels really weighty, like they're just going all out on each other because that's what fits. Because of that, it's hard to talk about more of the battles because that we have in the future. Because again, it ties directly into the story, and we don't want to spoil the story. Like I said, it's all about the situation. Making these one-offs help us tie the situation or tie the battle better to the story. Doing that development-wise, it's a lot of cost because we're creating something that fits only that situation that we can never use it again for the rest of the game. We've spent all this cost, all this effort creating one thing the player is going to play once and never use that again. So from a development perspective, it's like, why are we doing something like this? <laughs> So you guys play all the classic games, like on the regular, on the NES. So that's kind of what we were aiming for. Like the old NES games where all you have, you, uh, you, all you have one game, it's one concept the game is focused on. So for example, if you have a driving game, all you do in that game is drive. You may have different courses, but it's a driving game. For 16, we looked at our battles like mini NES games. We have this battle here. We're an action RPG, but why not have a driving game? And maybe for this battle here, we have a 3D brawler. And then we have this battle that's over here. So what if we had a battle that takes place with zero gravity and all that stuff? So it's just each boss is just made to experience different changes. Yeah, just saying the same thing over and over again, but elaborating on it a little bit more. Yeah, we're just going to have to see more of those. And that actually is the end of the Gamatsu interview. They want to show us, but it's all spoilers. So he just keeps saying it over and over again in hopes that that'll, that'll you know, tantalate or titillate the mind. You know, get us, get our, get our minds going in speculation. Man, I'm loving all the details that I'm hearing. A little bit of comedy coming from the dev team as well. But that three-part interview, that was pretty good. There's a few details towards the end that we were familiar with, a little bit too much in the way of repeating oneself. But I'm curious to see how a lot of this stuff ends up shaping up, especially after all of the gameplay bits that we got to see just a couple of hours ago. Oh, give it to me. Give me everything. It's going to be a hard next several months just trying to stay sane and uh <laughs> it's good. oh man <laughs> anyway that's it for the gamatsu interview and uh, alongside let me just make sure rpg fan and den of geek who are also asking questions in this one so on the youtube side thanks for tuning in hopefully you're as excited as i am about these various details be sure to discuss the comment section below twitch i need a few minutes break and then i might just hop on to octopath for a little bit and just take a break from a lot of the 16 stuff that's happening. But either way, thanks everyone for hanging out. I'll see you in the next one. And until then, take care. <laughs>